so another week of lockdown another episode of Rebel City Podcast um, this week's episode we spoke about a fair amount we had a lot of content to get through but first of all we checked in with each other and spoke about how we had sort of teetered on the edge of our own respective addictions and how we managed to sort of come back for that a nice wee conversation with Matt it's nice to decompress for these things um, spoke about JK Rowling's lack of self-awareness which is uh, apparent um, we get into an interesting observation about how people are watching things like Contagion and documentaries about viral infections and pandemics on Netflix seems to be a, a trend and how we're sort of a wee bit confused by that but I did a lot of sort of talking this week on a book that I've been reading, uh, Chaos by Tom O'Neill, which is about the Charles Manson murders and the links to MK Ultra. So if you're into that type of thing, you've definitely got a treat in store and I would recommend the book. It's been fucking incredible. I'm about halfway through. Uh, we also talk about what songs we would have played at our funerals, which is another thing that we've noticed trending on uh, social media. Um and the report that um, in the Guardian that the Tory government are siding with brands rather than uh, actual people who could produce PPE for them and Matt was telling me about a story how Kay Adams at the BBC ran a story that had to be redacted in the same area. We touched a wee bit more on new Labour leader Keir Stammer and the reports that are coming out about how in 2017 the party had deliberately undermined Jeremy Corbyn and some of your thoughts on that. And to sort of round off, uh, we spoke about America, Trump um, and uh, how Pierce Morgan's still a cunt. So um, I'm really enjoying doing these um, even though getting somebody to Skype in is not particularly ideal but I just want to say thank you to everybody who's been sending his messages of support and also people that are saying that the podcast is really helping them during a difficult time this is why we do it um, I love just sitting down and talking to Matt um, and hopefully <laughs> he likes talking to me as well but um, again we've had so many shares so many listens so many likes and so many people that are giving us positive feedback during these uh, sort of uh, unconventional podcasts that we're doing um, i just wanted to sort of say thank you and please keep listening liking sharing and sending us these uh, messages of support because it really does make it all worthwhile so with it more of me rambling on here's this week's episode and i hope you all stay safe and take care How's it going, man? Uh, I know bad, mate. Um, kind of just now in the depths of like isolation. It's it's I uh, it's becoming a some sort of by a chore to be honest with you. But at the same time, it's for the greater good, and you just need to get through, don't you? Aye, that's that's absolutely, mate. Aye, it's about. I, I think there's a lot of people are like we need. To, Get used to this or whatever. I don't know if, if there is much getting used to it. I think we just need to mm. sort of, I hate to say it, but we just need to sort of get through it and get Aye. to the other side. I was seeing stuff this morning on my news feed saying that the best case scenario that they're hoping for is at the end of this three weeks, they can go through a cycle, uh, gone backwards through the different styles of lockdown. So it'll be non-essential mm. retail will get opened back up um, and we'll need to still like be advised to stay home and socially distance. But the best case scenario for this being sort of mid to late May, I genuinely think that that's fucking pie in the sky. I don't think that it feels a bit like it just now. To be honest with you, I mean, I think that the government furlough scheme, which I'm currently partaking in, uh, has been extended to I think it was the end of June. So you know, when it was initially locked down, we were told roughly three weeks with the furlough potentially being May, we're now being told May with, you know, the furlough potentially being through to June. So I think, you know, 
there are best and worst case scenarios in play. Aye, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing the worst case scenario play out right right now as we're talking. It's what, Saturday. I don't even know what the fucking date it is, but it's the Saturday the morning. 17th. 17th and um, seeing scenes for I think it is it Missouri where people are taking to the front of their state building their official yeah. to, to um, protest being put in lockdown after the back of Trump basically yeah. just dog whistling them into doing it I mean this is well I mean he's been posting some pretty outlandish shit in the course of the, course of the last 24 hours um, amongst yeah. which is you know, liberate this state, liberate that state, and it's the states that are obviously seeing these, you know, almost like pro COVID nineteen protests. And you're like, it is a bit kind of like worrying that parts of or go to that extent where, in the face of everything, they would rather, you know, take the chance because of the economy. And you're just like, this is like tens of thousands of people all across America who are willing to take chances with their lives because people who don't give a fuck about them tell them, and it's absolutely insane. I know, it's, it is insane for the sake of the economy. I've seen an amazing meme, I think Monday or Tuesday, maybe even fucking who knows what day it was last week, where it was a, somebody mm-hmm. on the moon, like an astronaut on the moon, and a, an asteroid went split yeah. the earth in half, and it's like, oh Christ, what, what's going to happen to the economy? And that right. is that, that is kind of like where we are. It's like we're facing... In some places, aye. Aye, we're, we're facing, what, a potential... Five to five percent, or if that's us in lockdown, but potentially worst case scenario is ten percent of the population could be wiped out, and we're sitting mm-hmm. here worrying about the economy. Like, what's this going to do to business? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we were I think talking. There should be a secondary concern at this point. Absolutely, considering that it's a man-made fucking thing, <laughs> mm-hmm. and ultimately we've get we've got control of it, or certain individuals have got control of it. But um, mm. I mean, we were looking at a, a an article earlier on that I'd sent you about. Wuhan's been told that they can go out and eat and that's the non-essential sort of retail mm-hmm. and stuff, but nobody's going out to it. So what's the point? Yeah. This is this is where we're going to end up. We're going to end up in a pure 9-11 George Bush style where they're going to be like, get your money out there and get spending your money. It's up to you to get this economy back up and rolling. All the while, people are still going to be dying of this infectious disease that's... Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I'm... I'm I'm a wee bit confused as well when I'm seeing certain members of the, the UK government come out and say one thing. I mean, the Chancellor was saying that still the message is the same. It's it's people's lives above the economy, and then yeah. we've we've got other idiots coming out and sort of saying other bits and pieces. So, um, and there's been a fair bit of that both here and in America. To be honest with you, um, we've always had articles questioning the need to protect elderly people, as we discussed in previous episodes. We've also had some outlandish shit during the week about people questioning the extent to which, you know, domestic violence is, you know, surged during the lockdown as people are stuck in with their abusers, which to me seemed like an absolutely terrible take on the whole thing. And I mean, especially coming for a guy, um, you know, a privilege in the media, it just was all kinds of rang. Um, I know obviously a lot of these journalists have jobs to, you know, ask sort of what if questions, but I think some of them need to think about some of the questions that they're trying to ask. Aye. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, I like the lockdown itself, it's, it's one of the ones where the Wuhan thing, I, I can kind of get it. Like, I, I don't know how you expect to encourage, like, confidence in the retail and in the, you know, the hospitality sectors when there's no, a vaccine in place. Um, I think people are, have went through being no cautious enough in the build up to a lot of this to on the other side of it we're probably going to be overly cautious in mm-hmm. a lot of respects until such times our vaccines are in place and it's hard to really argue with that logic but then again as you say I don't know how much pressure people are going to come under when it comes to businesses starting to open back up again on a sort of limited basis, who knows mm-hmm. it's one of the ones I think we'll need to cross that bridge when we come here. Absolutely, I think that what's probably becoming apparent is is that they're going to need to adapt I mean we've been saying for the last four or five weeks that businesses only, we, we're probably only going to go back to the way things were and for everybody to just sit in their hands, especially mm-hmm. like businesses even small to medium. I mean, I'm the business expert. Absolutely fucking not. But I know for a fact that people should be looking at getting, if they really need their businesses up and running, they should be looking at alternatives. Um, there's a, a nightclub slash late night bar on Sucky Hill Street called Mango that's setting, mm. it's secondary sort of 
uh, thing is bar food and they've opened up their kitchen just to be an outright restaurant that delivers and okay. that's the type of thing that, I mean that's going to save that business you, you know what I mean you like, think so and you hope so anyway well fingers crossed for them but that's the type of thing that I think a lot of them need to do is they, they need to not sit in their hands now I understand if, if you're a personal trainer or if, I, I don't even know like a bus company transport there's, there's very little there's limits can, there's limits to what you can do but Sitting and taking government grants and waiting for everyone to open back up as normal at the end of May, start of June or July or August or whatever it happens, just doesn't seem right to me. It seems to me that especially we're going to be able to get some learnings for China, but it looks mm-hmm. like people are going to need to adapt their businesses and they'll just hope that the second the government advice becomes, right guys, back to work and back to, back to the high street, people are only going to go and congregate. It's going, and I think it's especially for things like sport and big events yeah. that gather a lot of people, musicians, comedians, gigs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, my personal opinion is you would need to be a wee bit sort of idiotic or stupid or silly, whatever way you want to say it, if the second yeah. that Boris comes out and goes, right, guys, we're at the, we're at the, the peak, off you go. I wouldn't be going and sitting in a room with 500 people. That's for fucking no. sure. I would be thinking twice about where I go and no, what no. I do. Do you know what I mean? No, no, right now. And I think when, even if you take maybe, for example, Scottish football, you know, stadia are built to cram in as many people as humanly possible because the incentive is to get as much ticket money through the gates as possible. And that, that's going to be the same across every sport, you know, that is affected by this. So mm-hmm. the notion that you can go and reopen sporting events and maintain things like social distancing um, doesn't seem possible to me, to be brutally honest with you. I think as the lockdown eases, we might start to see some closed door, you know, sort of sporting events start to creep back in um, as, you know, p- pressures and, and, you know, restrictions start to ease. But again, that's one of the ones that we'll, we'll maybe touch on later, given the sort of farcical black hole that Scottish football went down this week. But um, okay, For sure. I think um, we may now sort of been off um, this week. I've had a bit of time to kind of like, you know, a bit of introspection, a bit of, bit of reflecting, um, seen some articles uh, online, you know, government uh, public service adverts and various other bits and bobs. I've uh, seen also a really sort of timely tweet for um, sort of Cat Boyd at Radical Independence. Um, and it was just basically asking folk to kind of like question their drinking. Um, and obviously I've had on and off issues in the past. Um, I wouldn't say I was at any peak uh, in any way, shape or form, but I'm aware of the fact that um, I've maybe drunk a bit more in recent weeks with just all the pure mentalness of this. Mm. Um, so I kind of took the decision this week on reflection to go to total. Um, so I'm about eight days in um, at this point. So I'm up, I right. think I took the decision not long after we recorded last week. Um, so it's been interesting. Um, no feeling too much the fact that I did shakes for a couple of days, but Beyond that, I'm kind of glad. I think this, this time I've on, you know, had that time to think and I, I make the decision because I want to, whereas always in the past I felt like I did it because I had to. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, there's definitely a lot of drinking and shit going on out there and I'm not going to get all preachy about it because I've been fucking sober eight days or anything like that. But I would hope that, you know, with the time that folk have got in, maybe they take a wee bit of a think as well because uh, it's dead easy for it to become... You know, for me, it was like movie on a Friday night and then the next thing it's, you know, being a Tuesday morning and you're dossing about, kind of like, trying to find excuses to stay up for another drink. It's, uh, and these kind of like unreal times, kind of like, very easy to slide in that slope, I think. So, 100%, mate. Uh, hopefully folk can have a think about it. Aye, man. That rings true for me as well, mate. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that there's a lot of boredom that's happening um, and a lot of sort of, you need to fill your time. And especially Definitely. when you're, had experiences no matter how big or small or whatever impact it had on your life if you've experienced addiction boredom's got a lot to do with it do you know what I mean I, I had bouts of insomnia last week and even I could feel the sort of pull I was just sitting on social media at like fucking five six in the morning and you you can mm-hmm. even feel that sort of like that feeling coming back do you know what I mean or like what it used to be Aye. like and I'd said back at the start that I've tried to double down on my self care, and I've eased up. Mm-hmm. I've eased up quite a bit um, because I think it it was just maybe even just a wee bit of fear response for myself. Just been thinking if I'm going to be locked in, like I need to take care of myself. People are going to start yeah. freaking out, being locked up and it's stuff. Just a pure comfort gesture, isn't it? Hundred percent, mate. Um, I've I've t- I've wound that down a wee bit, but it it doesn't make it any 
like less important for me. Do you know what I mean? Like I, you definitely need to take care of yourself. I think, especially if you're going to be spending the majority of your time cooked up, there are going to be Aye. points of boredom. And I don't really have any recommendations for people other than if you've got stuff that Aye. you enjoy today, like I enjoy reading, I enjoy playing guitar, I enjoy listening to podcasts. Instead, I like doubling down on my self care, which was getting to the point where I felt like I was having to do it, and that's never mm-hmm. good if you're like having to force yourself to take care of yourself. Aye, if you're oppressing yourself. I I'm just f- trying to fill the hours that I've got with some stuff that makes me feel good about myself. Do you know what I mean? And makes me feel good about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um. I've seen a lot of people that it's like, and again, there's no judgment in it. It's just merely an observation. Absolutely not. But there's the like the three o'clock wine and like people mm-hmm. cracking open beers at like two in the afternoon, which is fine yeah. if you're out there and you're working Monday to Friday and absolutely you let your hair down and maybe you go for about a day drinking at the weekend. But I think I like you. I think if you're cracking that open on a Tuesday afternoon and that goes into the Wednesday and you're doing it, it will just end up a daily routine. Aye. And that's kind of where I was for a wee bit. I, 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 as I said in previous episodes, treated the first week as like a holiday week, and as part of the holiday week, I was sitting up late watching movies and having a few hoffs, and then quite quickly it became sleep, tidy the house, put the bins out, do the dishes, sit down, settle down, movie hoff, and that it just kind of. I actually got to spot the pattern quite quickly because of my history, which was quite good. But mm-hmm. then having the you know time to think about it in a manner that I don't ordinarily maybe, and maybe without some of the background noise or work and all that kind of going on, I actually kind of just took that minute to go, right, man, like we've been here before, you know what I mean? And at this point, I was like, it's just a pure cycle. And I just thought, you know what, let's do what we can to try and break it this time. Um, so we'll see, you know what I mean? Like, it's one of the ones I think there's, there's definitely... It's doing funny things to, to me than just sort of you and I, mate. You know what I mean? Like I definitely see a lot of folk out there who are, you know, at the limits of how they know how to manage themselves and stuff like that. And fair play to them for kicking on and trying their best, you know what I mean? Like that. That's all we can really do for ourselves at this point is just do what we can to get through it. You know what I mean? Like, if people are out there struggling, I mean, the, the amount of times mm-hmm. that we've said this on the podcast, but we've not spoke about like our own personal struggles or addictions for like. I don't even remember the last time we spoke about it but if there's people yeah. out there that are struggling with anything at all I mean I would absolutely invite them to, to reach out and, and talk to either your pals or even if it's me or whatever but yep. I absolutely man I think that like you're saying it, it, it is doing some funny things it's doing some funny things to not only like people who or maybe even active in addiction. I can't even imagine what it must be like if you're actively caught in an addictive cycle. Um, yeah. But even just for somebody who the majority of their time, like you and I, are on top of their shit and you'll slip here and there absolutely like anybody. We're all humans. But of course. Um, I think maybe the, last, the start of last week through to the sort of middle of this week, I could feel some sort of like old habits and old sort of like... Thoughts, mm-hmm. thought patterns, more than anything else that I managed to just sort of nip in the bud. So, aye, uh, man, I would, it, it is definitely going to fuck with us um, in different ways as we go deeper mm-hmm. into this. But I would invite anybody, if anybody's struggling or whatever, um, to fire in and DM the Twitter feed or DM me personally or whatever. I'm happy aye. to listen and to I'm people. Exactly the same as you in that respect, mate. If anybody feels like talking to us about my experience with drink or addiction generally can help them, then you know, the mail the mail, we're all in this together at this point. Um, one of the, I mean, in terms of sort of funny things, like, um, I was quite kind of surprised by um, J.K. Rowland's decision to be the, you know, the, the world's only millionaire making jokes about homeless people and breathing issues at a time like this. Um, no, I've, I've, I've missed this, mate. <laughs> what's, what's going on here? So she, she tweeted about going on a Zoom call um, which I had my I had my first Zoom call last night. Um, I got roped into a, a family quiz night where all my in laws basically cheated like bastards. Um, <laughs> He's playing. Uh, it was just like a, one of these like five topics, ten questions, like blah blah blah. Right. Um, but I think a few of them forgot that they were on camera whilst they were cheating, which was interesting. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> when they were getting like eight and nine out of ten, you were having to sit there and go, "Hi, okay." You know what I mean? Like so. That's been a bit of a phenomenon that has obviously been, you know, part of how people have communicated in recent weeks. Uh, and J.K. Rowland took to tweeting about how 
after five days without makeup, she went on a Zoom call thinking that she looked all right and ended up looking. I think the term she used was a homeless consumptive, basically meaning the homeless person with tuberculosis. And you're a bit like, <laughs> dude, like, what the fuck, man? I mean, come on. Like, people are like dying of respiratory distress, and now is not the time for your, you know, wizard castle to make jokes about people and homeless and, and, and you know, suffering with breathing diseases. Like, it was like tone deaf to the extreme. Like, so I think if we're going to have a the, the ongoing joke about this week's Corona plan, which it probably comes quite quite close. Aye, me. absolutely. Um, I mean, the concern for homeless people, uh, other than the lack of self awareness, which J.K. Rowling is not like. I'm pretty sure she's got a bit of history of sticking her foot in her gob. Um, I wonder why people are that interested in what she's got to say. I mean, like we're taking like societal advice and guidance for our own things, like independence and all these other things. And uh, as I say, a special, uh, a special subject is like fictional wizards. Like I don't <laughs> think, I don't think there are other Scottish authors that any time there's a political or societal issue pops up, they're maybe running to Irvine Welsh or you know Rankin or any of these other guys that kick about to be like, what do you think? But like the one person that has never had any sort of meaningful political context to their writing is the one that they go. So what are you saying to it? You know, I mean, it's always been a weird. It's always been a weird one for me. Okay, as a weird one, it's got to have something to do with the generation of people that grew up reading Harry Potter. I mean, surely they'll had some kind of like idolization for her. They, mm. They're undoubtedly like a fucking phenomenon. Like, and she's absolutely fucking stinking rich because of it. But I mean, Aye. what she's got to say, especially during like the, the independence vote and stuff, I had absolutely no interest in it whatsoever. But she mm-hmm. definitely has had history of being. Like lacking a bit of self awareness, or maybe right, thinking that in. she's a spokesman or some kind of like important uh-huh. voice for people. But uh-huh. in a time when the concern for homeless people is at an all time high, and we've spoke about it briefly on previous episodes as well. But not only mm-hmm. that, like a lot of people are suffering from a disease that attacks the respiratory system. To make a, a a joke like that. Um, it just seems ridiculous. Um, was there any? No. I mean, obviously there'd have been some kind of like backlash, but was there any comment for Rona or whatever? Like, else she just? I like, never. I seen the initial tweet and I seen people going on to about it, and I read like the first ten comments and laughed at some of the responses, and then moved on to my life. Um, but it definitely was one of the ones where I was like, "Oh my god, you fucking idiot!" You know, I mean, know. Like, why? You know, what I mean, just why? Um, the other one that I seen was this guy that was. I mean. It, <laughs> It was hilarious, and then it would get even more hilarious, but he, he'd suggested on his Twitter feed that we should sing Happy Birthday to the Queen. Um, if you listened to last <laughs> week's episode, I'm pretty sure you realise how we feel uh, in general about the royal family, but uh, they come out and be like... Let's cover all ground. <laughs> um, aye, exactly. But um, I got a couple of DMs about my Ramit <laughs> comment, which is quite funny. <laughs> but um, the... It came, I can't even remember who it was that. Um, I think it was at Ben Fogel or something. Ben Fogel, was. there we go. I came out and said that it, we should all come together and sing Happy Birthday to the Queen on the Queen's birthday, which is just like, no, you're all right, mate. Get to fuck with that <laughs> idea. But not only that, he then said in a, another tweet after the backlash that it was his daughter's idea. Which is like okay, oh, so, so he was the guy that was like using her as like a human shield in his in his Twitter I, video. He, he took a video of her explaining her idea. She looks about like anywhere. I don't. I mean, she could have been fucking eight between eight and ten. Let's just say that the way she is. So one, he's pa- tried to pass off his if it was her idea in the first place. Let's just say, but he's tried to pass he tried off. To steal it. He tried to steal it because there was no mention his daughter on the original idea. He's he's tried to yeah. steal his fucking daughter's idea. The majority of people have come back saying, right, mate, f- fuck off, basically, no chance. And then, like you just said, he's used his daughter as a fucking human shield, like brought her out to explain why she thought it was a good idea, man. It was just, I mean, we spoke about this in the first episode when we got in lockdown about these super egos and how people might implode and unravel. Mm-hmm. And this is an example of how celebrities will unravel, though they're being left to their end devices without their teams to give them the advice. <laughs> They're putting they're being their, to think for themselves for uh, once. Yeah, they're putting their stupid ideas of which I'm no immune to. Everybody has fucking daft ideas. But because they're constantly getting this sort of like um backing up of their ideas, like, yeah, that's a great <clears throat> idea, that's a great idea. And maybe even like a soft maybe maybe change that a wee bit, but like their teams before they air their fucking stupid ideas out into the public. Uh-huh. They're, they're they're putting them out there and now we're we're getting to see what these people that are supposed to represent us in some way, shape, or form. This is where I sort of like start to get 
that like disillusionment of like I don't think any celebrity out there really should be like a voice for you or a voice for generations of people. I think we've had plenty of celebrities sort of like try and ask not to be that, but unfortunately we live in a weird sort of society where yeah. celebrities day sort of speak to us because it's the only people that have got the platform where people actually fucking listen to them and we end up with yeah. situations like Kanye sitting putting the five zeros in his iPhone with his MAGA hat on sitting with Trump like some sort of like listen to me I know what I'm talking about it's like guys like he's are famous for a reason you're a rapper you're Aye. a TV presenter some of these are even just good looking like I don't know how much we should <laughs> I don't know how much we should be looking Aye, exactly good I think we'll, we'll maybe come out of this way a, a a renewed idea of like maybe we shouldn't be listened to intently to these people that are famous for mainly superficial reasons. That, I think what will happen is that PR companies will be able to just double their rates because they'll turn <laughs> into these celebrities and go, look, look at what how happened. much a mess you made of this when we weren't able to look after you. So look, like look what happened. double time. Double time. Don't, you know don't go on the internet and sing Imagine as some kind of like token gesture to people mm-hmm. to feel better about themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It's like fucking one of the one of the ones that probably does deserve praise this week in terms of like well, their efforts online and I, I, I instantly forget his name but the wee old army fella who was there in the lap sees Gerdon for the NHS and raised 13 million quid yeah. like that is how to take your platform and actually weaponise it for good um, it's an mm. absolute crime that one somebody you know pushing 100 years old is going to go to the lap sees Gerdon in the first place but at the same time, like people have pulled together and put a phenomenal amount of money away for PPE alongside guys like James McAvoy and you know hundreds of thousands of pounds that have been donated by you know folk mm-hmm. in this area. So yeah. I think as much as there are people making an absolute cunt of it, um, there are a few people out there, like the old army fella whose name escapes me now, um, who are just absolutely smashing it. So you know, fair fucks to them. Absolutely. I've seen a couple of people say that um, Matt, uh, Matt Hancock had shared the story um, and I've seen a couple of people commenting that I but if it had been 18 months ago you'd have probably tried to put him back to work so <laughs> let's not get too overly enthusiastic um, talking Aye. about the, the PPE crisis um, there was an article in The Guardian I don't know when the article was published it might have even mm-hmm. been very very recently the last sort of 24 hours um, let me just check that out for us um, Thursday it was Thursday night mm-hmm. Um that they had spoke to somebody who runs a textiles company who had offered to um, make PPE for the government and the government ignored it and gave the contract to Bobbery. Now, the, okay. the, the comment for the Guardian reporter is, is that basically the government are ignoring requests for companies that have already got like pre-existing infrastructure in place in favour of brand names. This company already had in place <coughs> the the textiles that are needed to make the like face masks or whatever. No, it was the um, the aprons that they need to. Um, it's right. a specific type of uh, plastic that needs to get right. used in these aprons. And this <laughs> company had a pre-existing um, supply chain in place for the textiles. Whereas what mm-hmm. Burberry had today was go and tender it. Um it was a Scottish business that actually won the contract to supply the plastic textiles to Burberry. But basically okay. and the accusation is is that they're they're bypassing the wholesalers of the textiles, the face masks. They're actually going mm-hmm. abroad to get some of these things. But the the government are favouring brand names and the the insider and the government and the Guardian was saying that it's basically so that the government use names that the British public already trust and it'll look good as like a sort of Brexit PR campaign. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, that's fucking ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? If, if you're trying to get a company to build a supply chain that doesn't exist... Um, in favour of somebody who's already got it all there it doesn't make a lot of sense it doesn't it? make any sense whatsoever I think we've got to be and as I say if you've seen it in the Guardian fair enough it's not a story I've, I've clocked I'm aware of the fact that um, through the course of the week there was a, a similar kind of stushy run um, PPE in um, public health England and I think Kay Adams it was on the BBC who went with a story saying that um, public health had instructed suppliers to only prioritise English hospitals and care homes. Turns out that wasn't the case. Um, it was more along the lines of these 
suppliers had existing contracts that they had just worked in similar terms to and didn't realise there was like the kind of quote unquote four nation policy. So there was stuff technically being shipped to these places as a priority, yeah. but it wasn't as a result of anybody in the government actually saying and it's all now being amended and corrected. According to the official line, which we'll, we'll take at face value, you know, um, mm-hmm. the national runway and then, got, you know, a lot of stick. And I, and I felt for them a wee bit in that respect because, you know, K Adams and the BBC are a fairly reliable resource. Um, you would imagine mm-hmm. that they've done their due diligence and stuff like that. They went with the story and the clarification came the next day after they'd already went to print and then there was, it was just like a pure no-win situation for everybody. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, maybe confusion around PPE and stuff like that, who provides it, who supplies it for where. And it's just because it's a, a topic maybe a lot of folks have never taken further before. <laughs> um, Along with a lot of things that we're talking about right now, do you know what I mean? We've never aye. really had to talk about it or know much about it. I feel like there's been a wee, a couple of instances where there's maybe been ranked place, ranked time with the media, which, you know, it's probably a benefit that we don't ordinarily be some of them. Um, but again, I think in these instances, you know, we're just going to have to wait and see how they pan out. You know what I mean? Hundred like percent. I think if we're going Definitely to ask our, the, sorry mate, I think if we're the, going to ask our media to investigate and dig in sort of real time, there will be certain mm-hmm. bits and pieces that they're going to fire out prematurely or maybe sort yeah. of like without every sort of angle. I, I suppose for us as as people that consume that media, maybe we need to change and, and be a wee bit more forgiven, but mm-hmm. that's dangerous in a world where we've got the... I, like what we were talking about earlier, you've got the Guardian, no, the Guardian, sorry, the, the, the Telegraph running with headlines about potential damage to the economy that would cost us more lives and we should just get ourselves back out there. It's that sort of like, I would love to give the, the mainstream media a, a lot of breathing room around this situation and how they report on what they report on. But mm-hmm. they've made so many deliberate mistakes in the past that people, I don't th- I think people are at the sort of end of their tether with that, do you know what I mean? And trusting them, but. Aye, I think in times. this instance they probably, as I say, I'm with you in this one. Like there, there will be people who think they want to get to, you know, scoops and all these other things, and aye, mistakes will happen. So in this instance, I know a lot of folk got up in arms and claimed bias and all this a lot of nonsense that usually gets flung about these days. But I think it really was just rank place, rank time for a few. Let me be honest yeah. with you. Um, try to take a break for all of this. Um, I've been kind of like immersing myself in, you know movies and whatever else that folk are doing um, and I noticed like a pure kind of similar to like when we were talking about what the algorithm pushes it is like I noticed a pure weird trend where on day one of the lockdown um, I don't know about you but the missus wanted to watch Contagion as oh, if, that you sounds know, like a good idea <laughs> I, it was fucking horrible man like, I obviously have a you know wife and stepdaughter and in the first 10 minutes of this movie the main guy's wife and stepchild died of the virus, and I was just like, "This is no my idea of fun." But like mm. over the course of the weeks, I've seen a new trend, and then I've also seen a uh, like outbreak pop up, um, and then yeah. the next thing that was trending, and I'm like, "Who the who who the fuck out there is like taking breaks for a worldwide pandemic by watching movies about a worldwide pandemic?" Like mm. it absolutely baffles me, man. So uh, me like, too. Um, I seen that there was the the, the pandemic documentary series on netflix um Mm -hmm. and right back when we first got locked in which was a week before the the rest of the nation get put into lockdown sharon was saying like let's start watching this and i watched the first couple episodes and then both is just had a sort of look at each other and we're like let's stop watching this (laughs) to me it feels a bit like porn um like people indulging themselves um i think that if sometimes if you if you have got a fear about something, there is something to be said about sort of exposure therapy, where you mm-hmm. you basically just open yourself up to every all your fears, and they're they're for some reason I don't understand it, but and and I've never read that deeply into it, but it supplies some kind of comfort um to people to just yeah. go buzz deep into something that they're they're worried about. I mean, I've done it myself. If I've like. I used to have a fear of flying and, and used to take mm. sort of full-on panic attacks and I would do nothing but watch it, like documentaries about aeroplanes and air crashes mm-hmm. and, I, and I don't know what it is about it but there's definitely something in us that loves to just go and sort of go down a rabbit hole that we're currently sort of in the middle of or we maybe see heaven like coming over the horizon um, Aye. Aye It's quite it's frightening as well how close to like how 
kind of really like accurately the the movie Contagion portrayed a lot of what went on. Mm. Um, it was it was really really eerie, and I, I, you know I'm sitting here watching like the Pizza Sun in Philadelphia for like <laughs> a million time just to like pure distract my brain. So fair play to anybody that's actually out there watching pandemic stuff, man. Like Aye. it just it is not for me. Unfortunately. Aye, Mine's has been. Yeah, uh, Parks and Rec. I started Parks and Rec again. Right. I think I'm about season three, which is a brilliant comedy. Same as uh, Always Sunny is a brilliant comedy, and I've took mm-hmm. to that. Um, this this falls into the same category for me personally, where I've made the conscious decision to distance myself from the news and distance myself mm-hmm. from Twitter um, for, for no longer than a couple hours a day because I find myself feeling that sort of anxiety and feeling that sort of cabin fever just gets. Yeah. Amplified whenever I'm allowing myself. I mean, it's self indulgent. Uh, it really is self indulgent just to go and and go down the rabbit hole and read everything. I need to know everything about this virus. And I think I come like you're saying. These movies are so fucking realistic. It it, it freaks you out a wee bit. You're like fucking hell, uh, man. man. It feeds the conspiracy. I mean, we've, we've covered a couple of conspiracies in the last few weeks, but it feeds that conspiracy theory that. Hollywood's in on everything and Hollywood basically <laughs> warns us about what's to come. Uh, um, I mean, this is like... posting for us. Aye, this is like our version of Thanos. Like, this is the 50% of the population's getting wiped out with this one. Um, right. When it comes to these things, the guys that make these movies, the people that, re- that write the scripts, they do incredible research. They have amazing research teams Oh, I, looking into, this one. I mean, this is the, 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 the Bill Gates thing where he did the TED Talks about a coronavirus in 2018 or whatever it was and, and he predicted mm-hmm. and he spoke about how we'd go into lockdown and people were like, how did he know that? He's had a hand in this. Right, oh, okay. Right. Or maybe your government's a bunch of fucking like babbling I buffoons. I did his research the same as the movie I, did. Everybody knew. Everybody knew it was going to happen. Anybody that, mm-hmm. that knew anything about... Um, like pandemics or whatever would have known exactly how this was going to play out. Fuck, mm-hmm. Sean knew about, I would say, conservative, about 50 to 60% of this back in January when it was starting to come out about China. Sean was saying, mm-hmm. like, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. She knew about, like, the, the, the curves and the peaks and this is all stuff that I had absolutely zero fucking idea about yeah. until fucking six weeks ago. But aye, I think the, 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 the information, it just shows you with these types of things like movies where you're like, this is so close to the bone. The information's all there. They know exactly what we aye. need today to, to stop this and to quell this. It's just whether or no we're willing to do it. Exactly. I think as well, like, one of the things that when you talk about, you know, social media and stuff like that in relation to all of this, like, we've become aware of how, and it's maybe a reflection of why people are watching things like Contagion and Outbreak, but, like, obviously, you know, death has been on people's minds, not to, like, pure bring it down there, like but at the same time, like, it is something that has really sort of jumped out at me in the last week is how sort of openly people are talking about, the, you know, the sort of deaths that are happening about them and the effect it's having on them. And it's, it's quite odd. I, I would hope, obviously, that it's, you know, a reflection of the fact that people can't have, like, proper funeral services and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and, and maybe know something more self-indulgent, as as you were saying. I'm conscious of the fact that I did see, you know, one person announce the death of somebody else's family member, which I found extremely weird. Mm. Um, I think people maybe sometimes need to be careful when you their own social media, because I've seen another one that was um, responding to the death of a celebrity that I'll no name. Um, and the response was pure, oh, this ruined my day. And you're like, like, well, I, of course, but like, thank you, the other guy. You know what I mean? Like, it was just a, such a strange, it's probably been completely innocent. And again, I'm no digging anybody out. Your, your own process is yours. Um, but I just, myself, I, I, I couldn't see me taking care of that type of business on social media personally. And I would say up front while we're recording that if this shit gets me, man, just like, Honestly, just replace me and don't make any further mention of it, all right? Um, like <laughs> right. Fucking, like, Katie Holmes in the Dark Knight or something like that, you know what I mean? Like, just, <laughs> I'll draft in a new Matt and just no mention aye, it, and hopefully it just, just goes like, past. People will be like, nah, that guy doesn't too. sound the same, but like, well, I had a call, it was all right. Aye. That, aye. that type, aye, man, I've noticed a lot of that. I don't know if, it, if it's got anything to do with just the fact that there is, I mean, just a matter of fact that a lot of people are, been affected yeah. by death right now um, or if it's 
if, if it is an impact to the fact that people don't have their usual outlets and don't have their usual ways Aye, of not dealing with like things, do you know what I mean? An I'm not saying it's an illegitimate form for public grief because funerals are there because public grief is a part of the, the sort of grieving process that we need. So I'm not booing, I'm just saying it's, a, it's an odd trend that Absolutely. I kind of observed and it kind of made me, kind of similar to these movies, made me a wee bit uncomfortable, but it's because I think after so many weeks of it being a kind of hypothetical thing, it's now starting to get really real for a lot of folk. Absolutely, um, man. My, I include myself in that 100% clearly. Yeah. I did see one guy, though, that kind of, I did enjoy his, his, his part of, um, a, a lad um, had posted uh, a Spotify playlist for songs to play at his funeral if he dies. And obviously it was quite, you know, it was a morbid general <laughs> topic, but it was, it was quite lighthearted. And like, I know it was like, the way it was done was kind of like mere celebrating what was what was kind of cool. Um, so obviously there is a, a level of humour out there or laughing at the, you know, at the, into the void or whatever, you know what I mean? As well as, you know, some of the mere sort of grim, Incarnations there. Um, by what would yours be like if you had to have? So what was it? How many songs was it? I don't know, man. I think it was like four or five. I think if you, I don't know if you've ever been to like a private, you know, non-religious thing. Yeah, um, I've been to like what humorous like funerals and. Uh, nah, mm. I, so I think I think if I was going to pick, I'd, I'd definitely have Johnny Cash. So like Folsom Prison Blues would be one. Thought you were going to say Ring um, of Fire, there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> my dad told me a story years ago about a, a funeral, a, a cremation that he went to where the guy's out song was Ring of Fire, which I thought was quite funny, but no, it was too obvious. Uh, so Folsom Prison Blues, I think, I definitely have some news on there. So like, Plug In Baby, probably, maybe Nights of Sidonia, just because they're as muses, muse songs get. Mm -hmm. um, my favourite song ever, probably as well, like Sympathy for the Devil, definitely. You know, Superb. you're going to have to have sympathy for the devil if I'm heading his way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably the Guns N' Roses version, if that's maybe no too controversial. Right. Um, and then probably aye, a bit of Oasis. I think I'd have some like Don't Look Back Man go for a big sort of sing song at the end. Right. So it's some good choices, man. I remember like hearing Sympathy for the Devil for the first time. I think it was on the, the soundtrack for... Interview with Vampire. Interview with Vampire, I and like I'm with you, man. Like I, I love that song. I, I grew up in the Rolling Stones because my dad was like a huge Rolling Stones fan. I think yep. he was he was a teenager in the sixties, so you were either Stones or Beatles, and he picked the Stones. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and you still always say to me the Beatles were a boy band, which they kind of were, but still fucking yeah. phenomenal. But um, I love that song, and then I heard the Guns N' Roses version it because it's a rocked up version, and I'm a rock fan. I was like pure fucking whoa, man. That's incredible Aye. and i seen an interview with slash one time where i don't know who was interviewing him but the guy had mentioned it he was saying that my favorite guns and roses song isn't a guns and roses song it's a rolling stone song and it's your cover of sympathy for the devil and slash said that he hates that he absolutely Aye. despises that version of the song and the reason for it being was because um they recorded it in completely separate recording studios it was the last thing that they did on the recording Sessions for Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, which was mm -hmm. the last sort of albums, that the like, original albums that they did. And it, yep. he says it literally documents the breaking up of the band. They never, ever rehearsed it. They learned all their parts separately, went into the recording studio separately and recorded it all completely separately. And it just goes to show you, man, because I, I'm with you. I love that version of that song. And I think oh, it's I. fucking phenomenal. Like Axl Rose singing Sympathy for the Devil, Slash playing Sympathy for the Devil. You're like, fucking bring it, man. And it, it, you listen to it, it's incredible, but for his perspective, he despises it and he's never listened to it because it's the sound he's band breaking up. It just shows you, man, like how like context is everything when it comes to uh, anything, whether it be a movie, absolutely. a TV program, or a fucking a, a song. If it hits you at a time in your life when you appreciate it, you appreciate it that wee bit more. If it hits you at a time in your life when you don't appreciate it, you don't appreciate it that wee bit more. But just a sort uh, of right. strange sort of story. Um, cool. Like when have, that, you get, have you got tunes? Um, I would definitely, I like, I would probably have um, Nirvana Unplugged in New York. It's the, um, Where Did You Sleep Last Night? I think I would have uh, that in there. I've seen, I seen Elvana um, oh, yes. about three or four months ago. For those of you who don't know who Elvana are, 
Um, it's a Nirvana cover band fronted by an Elvis impersonator. It's fucking incredible. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it is honestly the most fun. They did a segue between... Um, what was it? They did a little less conversation, a little less action segue than a Smells of Teen Spirit. And they had um, Love Me Tender segueing into Rape Me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, man. And they were flawless. They were absolutely flawless. Um, so I did it. Brilliant. Their, their, for the first time, they did their covers uh, and the encore, and it was the unplugged stuff. And they came out and they did Where Did You Sleep Last Night? And they did The Man Who Sold the World as well. And they were absolutely phenomenal. Aye, superb, man. But that would I nearly bust my voice screaming that one back in. That would that would be enough for me, I think. Um I'd need I'd just because music this would be like literature or whatever for, for other people mm-hmm. or music's such a thing for me that I just have about a million songs that just just instantly just <laughs> black I think I would probably have Blackbird. I love the the song Blackbird. Maybe even Eleanor Rigby, I don't know. I would okay. definitely have a Beatles track in there. Um, Eleanor Rigby would bum me the fuck out if I was at your funeral. I know. Th- so that's I was that work. was my first thought was Eleanor Rigby, and I thought, well, <sighs> really? Um, that's why I was like, well, why no Blackbird? It's a song about um, the the Black Power movement in America, and like I I, I love that song, so I would probably cool. ma- maybe get that in there. So that's two or three. Um, what else would I go for? I would. Ma- I'd hate to have one, but. I always, when I was a teenager, and it's never really left me, I always wanted to have Fields Arf and Rye played at my funeral. Um, it's <laughs> All right. one of my favourite Celtic songs just growing up, um, and our folk songs even, just in Some general. Some of the lyrics are beautiful. Absolutely, time. mate. And do you know what? At a wedding I went to, maybe about 10 years ago, a guy, an Irish guy stood up and said, I hope nobody in the crowd is going to be offended, but this is my favourite folk song for where I come from and it's part of my culture and I don't support any football team they've got me interested mm-hmm. in football and they sang the fields off and right and there were many Rangers supporters and they all applauded the guy so I've got like a sort of soft spot with that where I was like do you know what that is I, I, I've witnessed a transcendent moment between Celtic and Rangers fans at a wedding and also Aye. I always said when I was a teenager Fields Aff and Rye will get played at Mafia No when I was a bit of a wee dick so I'd probably get the Fields <laughs> Aff and Rye on there um, other than that I, I, I don't know man uh, maybe a Zeppelin tune I don't know maybe mm. War Pigs just as everybody's Ooh. walking as everybody fucking or um, Black Sabbath Black Sabbath just as everybody goes to leave just the, the raindrops start Aye. and fucking butter out a, a, a metal classic for everybody <laughs> so that might be that might be my, my picks for that um, something that I've been doing, as I've mentioned before on the podcast, um, is I'm trying to read a book a month that mm-hmm. I've been doing all right um, so far. Uh, we're, 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 we're at April. I think I've done three books. So I'm, I've finished three books. But um, a couple of weeks ago, I started um, a book called Chaos by a guy called Com- okay. Tom O'Neill. Right. Now, Tom O'Neill just quickly because I, i'm like nine chapters into this so i'm not going to give you the full flavor i'm just going to give you a flavor of what i've been reading in, the, in his book but he was an investigative journalist that was hired by a prominent newspaper in america to investigate the charles manson case um and about th- right. three months into it he decided that he wasn't going to write it for an article for a newspaper he was going to write a book now he started investigating it in 1999 and his book came out two months ago so it took him 20 years 20 years to write this book um and i've watched a podcast wait a minute um because i I googled him seeing he'd done a a, a three-year-long podcast and i listened to it and the reason it took him 20 years is because the majority of people that he was looking into this were dead so a lot of the the main players that he was looking at of what died but basically he has and i think that this is a lot of people are now talking in these terms when it comes to like Charles Manson that they reckon that he's been linked to MK Ultra in one way, shape, or form. Now the the link is okay. it, the link's there, and I mean if the guy's evidence is it, it it's concrete, you know what I mean? He's got like right. CIA documents about like what went on, but basically like 
Charles Manson was uh, the son of a prostitute and he'd been in and out of the care system in America yep. and he'd been in and out of um, prison, predominantly fre- federal prison as it had been. Mm-hmm. Um, his parole officer in the 60s was a CIA drug scientist called Roger Smith. Okay. So the first things that really like made this guy, uh, Tom O'Neill, start to go, I need to dig a wee bit into this, was the fact that Manson constantly broke his parole conditions and not yeah. once did they ever put him back into jail they constantly kept on letting him away with stuff um okay. so he went when he got let out one of the times he went straight to san francisco for la and you're not allowed to leave like the city or whatever when you're on parole yeah. the parole infrastructure in america told this guy smith that they had to get manson back in jail but then a name that's been redacted for the document somebody above came in and told the parole the parole people to basically let it go that they're only going to put this guy back in jail so they wreck okay. he the tom o'neill guy thinks that he's been an informant now he, he also caveats that with saying that an informant can be gain information but also actually actively doing stuff in the field for cia yeah. fbi so it's not just like gain information yeah. his, his parole meetings took place at a drug clinic where manson would take the girls that were part of the Manson family and they would do like abortions on them and they would get drugs for like STIs and STDs that he was like like passing okay. on to them. So that's yep. like another thing where you're like, that's a bit weird. Why the fuck is he having pro meetings where a drug scientist and like a, a, a drug center? Do you know what I mean? Like what the fuck is mm. going on here? Um, The guy, Rod, Roger Smith, that was his parole officer and the drug scientist he became the foster parents of charles manson's kids when he went to jail whoa so that seems inappropriate ridiculous right he he recommended during the murder trial he lied on the stand so he said that he that manson had permission to go to san francisco for la which he didn't um and he Mm -hmm. lied while under um oath which if you lie in a murder case you're actually potentially could get the death sentence. So he, you're aiding and abetting a murderer. Exactly, exactly. So that was another thing. He lied on the stand, which was weird. When the women and the Manson family went to trial for the murder of Shannon Tate, who was Roman Polanski's girlfriend, um, yep. I think that's been brought into sort of popular culture recently with uh, Once Upon a Time yeah. in Hollywood. Um, the Tarantino thing. Yeah, Exactly. He recommended and used his power to get them probation and no sentenced. So he, he gave character witnesses to these women um, and actually like said that they're good women. He'd known them for two years and he was a, a federal parole officer and X, Y, and Z. And the judge let them go for the first while before they actually got convicted, which is another thing you're like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, oh, So like they basically got bail on his word? Yeah. Um, I the the suspended sentences or whatever it was that they they managed to get, but they mm-hmm. they ended up in jail and ended up getting things yeah. for the murder anyway. Um, so the medical clinic that um Manson was gone and getting his uh his probation meetings in with this guy was ran mm-hmm. by a guy called Jolly West. And Jolly West, even though he's got a fucking hilarious name, like fucking, Aye. he was the top researcher for MKUltra. And all this is all noted. So this is all like, all, right. all the documents are there and all been photocopied and included in the book. So this is, it just gets mm-hmm. wild and wild and wild. Jolly West then went on to become the head of psychology at UCLA and was an expert in celebrity stalkers. And he took, he wrote a, like a massive book on the murder of John Lennon. So you're like, right, mm, this guy's been the top head researcher at MK Ultra, ended up in a massive, massive position of power within like the educational system as it came to like psychology. And he, mm-hmm. he, he wrote like an extensive book on the murder of John Lennon, which is just another sort of weird one. But after this guy died, they looked through his UCLA files and found letters between him and the head of M- MK Ultra. So well, this is just it just goes down this other sort of like rabbit hole, rabbit hole, rabbit hole. The, I so I'm think, at a, I'm, um, sorry, mate, on you go. I was going to say, I think in terms of what I understand for like the MK Ultra stuff and uh, having previously seen the likes of Wormwood and not and not um, and stuff like that, that 
Manson priorities, Manson family days probably would have been a prime candidate to have been included in some of these types of tests because at that time there was a, a school of thought that says you can amend and change abhorrent behaviour in people who are, you know, clinically unwell, yeah. uh, mentally, weigh things like LSD and stuff like that, and there was a lot of tests done. So I can imagine that somebody like Manson would certainly fit the profile for these types of experiments. Um, well, they did it on prisoners. They, One of the things uh, that they did was they, they, they conducted the, the early experiments on um, military people and prisoners, and Manson mm-hmm. was in a prison where one of the guys who had been a whistleblower um, for the MK Ultra, like 1973, 74, they were in prison at the exact same time. But I've not got to that chapter yet. I've only, I only know right. that because I've listened to the podcast. So I'm ruining the right. book for myself. But the 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 bit that I'm on, um, which was so the head of MK Ultra that I'm talking about, the the they've seen these letters between this guy West. There's a guy called uh, Richard Helm. Um, mm-hmm. He became the director of the CIA in 1963. So he was the director of the CIA when the Manson murders happened. Wow. There's, um, he was the guy that coined the term hypno-assassins. So the, the MK Ultra aim was to create the Manchurian yeah. candidate type sleeper agents that would mm-hmm. th- then go on. Um, they sent people to infiltrate the counterculture in the 60s. So they sent... Yep more than 50 individuals to infiltrate the hippie movement, the Black Panther movement and the feminist movement to stop communism. So they thought what they thought was about to happen was a mass uprising um, mm-hmm. and sort of communism in America. Um, and that before I go into the, the chapter that I'm on, which is the bit that's sort of like a, a mix between sort of creepy, horrible and like what the fuck has happened here. Uh, Manson yeah. believed, so Manson's belief was that there was a race war that was about to happen, and the yep. be- the lyrics in the Beatles' White Album told Manson that he would be the saviour and that he mm-hmm. would repopulate the earth with his white children. So it was like a sort of white supremacist, weird sort of yeah. white supremacist thing, and he wanted to stoke a race war. So the, the murder of Shannon Tate... Uh, he, yeah, he had sent in his Manson family to murder a, a bunch of sort of affluent white people in Hollywood and then blame it on the Black Panthers so that the police would then attack the Black Panthers igniting this race war that he thought that he was yep. going to be the saviour. So that was that's like that's all that I've really read in the links between Manson and the MK Ultra movement. But the the chapter that I'm on, they talk about this case of a guy called Jimmy Schaefer. Um he was an ex military guy who raped and murdered a three year old in oh. nineteen fifty four. Now he got found uh, naked, covered in scratches, and he didn't know what had happened and he didn't even know his own name. So when they first found him, he could not he didn't he didn't even have any idea who he was yeah. or what had happened. Within twenty four hours, Jolly West became his psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. So this guy who <laughs> is the top researcher um, and the guy that's in this medical clinic that Manson's gone to to get his parole meetings becomes this guy's psychiatrist. So he took him for the sheriff's office to an airbase, gave him truth serum and recorded a, um, like a, he admitted to this rape murder of this wee girl. Okay. The sheriff noted in his official documents that when the guy came back, he was in a trance and he just kept on repeating the same sentence over and over and over and over again. Um, wow. that's, what happened was is that after that, they interviewed the him. Chemically coerced con- confession or something? It sounds that? like it. Or something strange has happened when this uh, Jolly West guy took this ex-military murder or rapist guy to whatever airbase he was and brought him back. Mm. After it, the official... Um, lawyers or whatever when they when they uh, interrogated this guy, he claimed that the wee girl had been an abuser fr- from his childhood. It had been a cousin. So he said that he didn't rape and murder a three-year-old girl or four-year-old girl. He'd actually raped and murdered somebody that abused him in his past. So, which is just f- so fucked up and weird. Aye. The bit in the book that get at the end of this chapter, but this is taking you right up to date, is is that two months after this happened, West sent Helm a letter saying that he had new technology where he could replace people's old memories with new memories right after this guy got convicted of the rape and murder of this wee lassie. 
Wow. So this is where I'm with mean. this book. This book is fucking incredible. I mean, if it was a movie, it, it's getting made into... It's apparently been bought by Netflix. So I'm sure within okay. the, the next couple of years... Don't know how long these things take, but within the next couple of years, we'll start to see like docu series getting made um, along Aye. the same lines it, that the other docu series. It kind of sounds like Charles Manson is probably one of the least interesting parts of that story. To be honest with you, I get that we yeah. being tangentially linked to him. Um, that's where the guys like Netflix is not these, you know, going to get involved because oh, you know, serial killer story. We're all we've been over it a hundred times already. People are into it. You know what I mean? Like, but for me, I think what may have held my attention about what you're talking about is that people were obviously being extremely dodgy in the background, and we know that they were. I mean, MK Ultra and you know the various trials that led to it and have you know branched off from it um, are fairly sort of common knowledge in a lot of respects now. Um, Absolutely, aye, that's, aye. that's wild. The guy Helm. When he left his position of power, I mean, he basically destroyed all the documentation that was anything to do with us. I mean, he left his position in 1972 or 1973, and then the whistleblowing started to happen in the sort of mid-70s when he right. got in front of Congress. But the only reason that Tom O'Neill got his hands on any documentation had anything to do with us at all was because of the links with UCLA and obviously all the correspondence would have all been... Um, documented and put in files and then when the guy died it you can just go and sort of grab it so yeah i'm on again um the the book it's called fucking chaos it's incredible netflix will pick it up and i think you're bang on man like he's using the sort of charles manson that famous story as a way to sort of shine a light on some of the shit that actually happened in this um exactly i think that's probably something we need mary because a lot of that shit is pretty well documented, but like, aye, the aftermath that it left in people's lives, I mean, what effect did, you know, potentially testing guys like Charles Manson with LSD have on them when they then went back out into the world? I mean, if this happened prior to the Manson clan or the Manson family and the, you know, the range and all these types of places, um, then surely they have to consider themselves at least a contributing factor in it because, as we know, we're the sum of all our parts and all our experiences and if his experience was being, you know, sort of chemically tortured and whilst in jail and his perception of reality toyed with, you know, that could easily have had an impact on his actions later in life. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, so that's something that maybe they need to look at taking a bit of more responsibility for, to be honest with you. Right. Um, I think in terms of um, conspiracy, I think we're going to have another one of these pure slick segues that we've been just Stuart Barman, uh, Stuart Horneman, sorry. <laughs> um, we went through the notions of sort of fictional uh, or potentially fictional conspiracy to, well, an actual conspiracy within the Labour Party. Um, we got news this week and Keir Starmer's second week as, as Labour leader um, of act, or, you know, actions taken by the party HQ during the 2017 election to actually stop actively stop Jeremy Corbyn from becoming Prime Minister. Mm. Um, it's, what, eight, 900 pages long, and we're obviously starting to see snippets of it. Um, it's not a great look for the Labour Party, and it's definitely not a great look for some of the people that Starmer's trying to work with. I know, obviously, we kind of briefly touched on his appointment last week. Right, before um, the fucking... Into, the technical issues just took it out. I had to just edit, edit it out, but... We were getting a bit of them just being a wee bit of cookie-cutter, centrist, sort of copy-and-paste politician. Yeah. Um, and now this week he's faced with, you know, over, well, at least sort of credible evidence that his end party tried to hamstring his predecessor. I mean, and I think... I think it's wild, man. I think it's absolutely... Yeah, it I mean, to think that people would put what seems to be like sort of personal relationships or personal dislikings of individuals above what impacts millions of people on a day-to-day basis. Like, get it right that the Tory austerity last 10 years, and the amount of times that we've said this, we're saying it until we're blown in the face, but I'm going to say it again, it has literally contributed to people losing their fucking lives. And to think yep. that somebody... Even or, now? I, even now, exactly. And to think that there are people within the opposition party, the Labour Party, that are supposed to be, I mean... 
morally better or whatever, depending on your viewpoint, or yeah, that would actually actively hamstring the leader to stop him becoming the prime minister. And at the time, it was Theresa May gave her a minority yeah. government. It, I've got two things that went through my mind. So the first thing that went through my mind was like that's wild and crazy and I'd have never thought but then my second thought was like this totally makes fucking sense like this this yeah. com- this completely makes sense mm-hmm. I don't know I mean on the Stammer stuff he was out the other day saying that he he's not going to come up with any alternatives to the government's current sort of response to the coronavirus and yeah, so it's like the so, so who are you? Well, like, what, 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 do you know what I mean? What's your fucking joke? last week where he was asking us to, you know, basically agree with the government mayor and now this week it's trust the government mayor and you're like, this is where my concerns initially lay when we talked about him being that kind of like, you know, cookie cutter, copy and paste job. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's went for him wanting to agree with the government more, wanting us to trust the government more at a time of crisis. Uh, and now we also see that the party machinery behind them has effectively swung the election against their own you know, their own interests. Um, I think given that 2017 was a hung parliament, well, it's, it's even more shocking because there was a real, I mean, what was Corbyn? Something like a couple of thousand votes and a few key constituencies away from what he needed. 2,800 votes or something, was that a scene? I, I, I couldn't tell you the exact figure, but it was a, a relatively small number in the grand scheme of things. Um, so we could have had, you know, a completely different response to the last couple of years you know, a completely different approach to Brexit where he wanted Brexit, so they still probably went ahead, but it might have went ahead in mere sort of cordial terms with the EU uh, and there would have been no risk of things like no deal, which again has sort of creeped up again this week. Um, as I said, they won't extend the deadline and, and you know, in line with the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus issues. Um, so, you know, there can be a completely different approach to the last couple of years. Think about what a Jeremy Corbyn government could be doing for us at a time like this. You know what I mean? Like, uh, there's massive, massive questions to be answered, I mean, and I'm not sure that the people that are there are the ones to really give answers that we can. Trust. No, this is a problem. Is is that the Labour Party since? I mean, fuck knows when, but definitely since the Iraq War has been mm-hmm. taking an absolute shoon in the eyes of the people that have put their trust into that yeah. party and the people that support that. Um. I've got I've got so many concerns with this. I mean, but a lot of them kind of come back to the fact what we were saying two minutes ago is that they only an opposition under somebody like Star Star or and no. and they were only an opposition to any sort of like actual. To- let's take away like the titles of like Labour mm-hmm. and Left and under Blair they they were nothing but a continuation of Thatcherism. I'm worried about where this leaves the left in the UK. Like I I don't know. How if you're a socialist, if you're a socialist member of the Labour Party, what do you do now when you see the party you've spent? You've been out chatting doors, you've been out fighting, you know, pounding the streets for years under Corbyn to find the party now controlled largely by the people who undermined them in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing that policy and notions of opposition are going to come second fiddle to things like agreeing with the government mayor, yeah, I think you probably have to ask yourself a serious question about you know, is the Labour Party still the place for you? And I know I've seen mm-hmm. quite a few people asking that question. I personally don't know what the answer is now because I also see other, the other thread, the other chain of thought that says, well, if Corbyn can stay, you know, everybody can stay and, you know, the, the heart and sort of soul of the Labour Party is something that's worth fighting for. And, and I can see that side of it as well. But how it pans out for here, I've got absolutely no idea. I mean, it's hard to see how the electorate can ever trust a party that can't trust itself. Um, mm. And I think right now that's kind of where we are. Yeah. Um, I think it's also reflected in his early poll. And I think for his first week, you know, Starmer had like a 10 point drop on the Tories. Um, now, obviously, national crisis is going to allow for a level of goodwill towards the government, but 10 plus points, just having your name announced, um, probably tells you about his chances. Um, Unfortunately. It's, 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 Aye, it's a bit of an open goal as well because I kind of want people to look at the you know the opposition. How can you not beat some of these guys? And we've been saying this all through Corbyn's time, looking at you know May, looking at Cameron, looking at Johnson, and being like, how can you not beat these guys? Like, you know, you're talking about a prime minister shaking hands with coronavirus patients and getting ill. 
like a health secretary that wants to blame NHS staff for shortages in PPE and thinks that giving them a badge is a great substitute for actually paying them a proper wage. Like, I don't, I don't get how you don't beat these guys. You know uh, I mean, I've seen this all the way around the fucking planet. I mean, we spoke last week about how Biden is not going to beat Trump in my mind, um, and how in any way, shape, or form can the Democrats know Paul the Giller, a candidate that can beat that fucking idiot who has completely mm. and utterly fucked this up to the highest oh. degree? So, but it 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 seems to be happening everywhere. Um, mm. The the one thing that I would say that I I. I've got a real big distaste for as we know for a fact that the Tory party have been in turmoil since William Hague, maybe even before that, maybe even under since major mm-hmm. and there has been splinters happening and fractures happening all the way from top to bottom within that party. And you don't yep. see any of that getting reported in the media. It is literally, they stonewall it. They don't. I think, I think you did get a level of reportage on it, but I think what the telling factor is, and, and you see it in both, the Conservatives in the UK and the Republicans in the US is that when the chips are down and it comes election time, they're able to park their shit and pull in one direction. And particularly things like the Democrats, when you see Biden go up against Sanders, Sanders go up against Clinton, like those different schools of thought tell them apart. Same as with Labour and Corbyn and, you know, the guys that are now in place. Like the two or three factions that are pulling for sort of control of the party separate and divide their vote to a point where they're effective and effective. Whereas the Tories and the Republicans or the more conservative think people are able to actually like bridge those gaps when it comes time to get business done. You know what I mean? And I think mm. that's something that the left needs to be more aware of everywhere is that you, you know, divide and conquer is still something that happens to them every election cycle. And sometimes you just need to park the shit and actually go out there as one voice because it clearly makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm I'm interested to see where it goes. I'd be even more interested to take a step back and see where it goes if we were sitting in an independent Scotland. But no. <laughs> it feels to me like the Labour Party are just going to go for crisis to crisis, which <laughs> it doesn't help us really when we've got no. the current situation. We get out the other side. Questions need to get asked, and the leader of the opposition's out saying back the government's like fuck you, dude. Do you know I mean, what I mean, this ten point drop in the polls was before any of this two thousand and seventeen shit happened. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like this isn't a result of scandal within the party. Like they were already ten to twelve points done before this news broke, and you're just like, as an opening two weeks, you know, it's it's an absolute disaster for the guy Starmer. So as like, right. and yeah, maybe they can pull it together. I don't know. I think. Um, you obviously Trump, uh, touched on Trump um, in the US and has just complete mismanagement. We've obviously been passing comment on a kind of week-to-week basis and uh, this week, even for Trump standards, it go absolutely fucking wild. Um, I don't know if you've seen at the start of the week there, I know obviously you've been working and shit. Um, he, he, he took a press conference where he sat people down in the White House, you know, press room, and was like, so give us two minutes, guys. Put a video on a uh, all the other sort of partisan media outlets to him praising him. And these journalists were like, hold on a minute, this isn't it. We're here for a coronavirus briefing. Notice it through your best of compilation to <laughs> fucking Fox News. Fucking PR like, campaign. Aye, so CNN actually cut him off live on air and were like, well, no broadcasting propaganda. And you're like, that's how seriously they took it. The week was then followed up with multiple press conferences where he's petulantly arguing with journalists for the podium. Yeah, uh, I've seen a bit of that. And at one, at one point, I actually said to a guy, if you don't stop asking me questions, I'm going to leave. And you're like, you're at a fucking press conference, good. I mean, like, what are you... You know, I'm taking my ball and going home was a lot of the chat about Aye, it. Man. And it's, it's very much like that. I mean, I've never seen a guy so... Arrogant on the podium, deciding that he's going to dictate the terms in which journalists do their jobs when it comes to him. It's absolutely staggering. It really is, um, man. Um, the thing that, I mean, he's setting some really fucking dangerous precedents here. Like, he, he's setting yep. for the next person to just follow suit with that sort of like dismissal of any questioning. Like, any time he's been asked in the last sort of three weeks, anything that I've seen, and I've seen sort of a little bit, but Anything that I've seen dipped into, 
he's just attacked anybody that's questioned him. Oh. And he, as somebody in a position of power like that, and for somebody who's supposed to have the sort of checks and balances to make sure that they don't get too carried yep. away with their power, like I said, man, he's setting some very, very dangerous examples that will, you know for <laughs> a fucking fact in the future, will just get manipulated and will get oh, sort right. of like set upon and people will use it to it's their the own intention advantage. Button to it. That's the intention. Man. And I think when you talk about the checks and balances, this was another one of the ones that I wanted to touch on from through the week, but at one of the press conferences, he actually claimed to basically have total power over America. And like the journalist was just like, no, no, you don't. He was like, no idea. I've got complete control of what goes on in America. And I'm like, okay, so that is completely contradictory to your constitution, which gives the Senate and Congress equal footing as well as the courts. Um, but at the same time, this is a guy that's put, I am all powerful, I am the man. And then I'm like, cool, so if you're the man, why are you to blame for this? Why are you to blame for that? Blah, blah, blah. No, that's the governor's. So he spent the rest of the week <laughs> basically palming off everything that went wrong on the individual state governors whilst stoning in front of the press, showing them like fucking, you know, YouTube videos that, you know, bloody Hannity or somebody's put together for him. Um, so he wants all the praise, but he wants none of the responsibility. Yeah. I think even at one point there's a quote from him actually saying, no, I take no responsibility for that, but I don't know how many, if that's recent or that's older, and somebody's maybe just dropped it into what I was watching. Um, you know, he's cut World Health Organization funding, yeah. saying that they were too slow to react to the coronavirus, <laughs> even though he was stunning there in fucking January going, I have got 14 people wait, but that'll go down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is this is a guy. You know what I mean? Like, um he's lost it. I think he's aye. actually he's actually losing it. And this is the the problem that what what I'm seeing uh, for the very little that I'm looking into it is is that people on the people in America that have backed him previously aren't they really losing that much confidence in him? Even though we are witnessing the the leader of the free world literally collapse f- into themselves in oh. press conferences. People right. are they're, again. They're doubling down on this, like Trump's our guy, but and he's. I mean, he represents, and that's what I think. Again, going back to the, the sort of the top of the show, people are out protesting, being locked down. You're being locked down right. to save your fucking life and save your family's lives, and yep. you're out there with your American flag, protesting, screaming, "Let us out!" At, at governor's right. offices, at, at America is just went mental and this Aye. this virus has done nothing but just fucking just highlight that even more um, he's if, done um, he's done he's done actually a fair bit of electioneering during it which I thought was quite well inappropriately funny um, I've seen another story through the week saying that people's what they call stimulus checks or you know the equivalent of uh, UBI or follow um, these checks were delayed going out to Americans by the million because he wanted his name printed on them. Yeah. So he wants he wants these people who he considers idiots to see a check come through the door with his name on it and go, I'm going to vote for that guy. Uh, you know what I mean? As if he himself is personally yep. paying money into people's bank accounts and it's actually caused like hundreds of thousands of people to go without money that they vitally, vitally need. Uh, because Dude, I think the worst hit, vanity, I think the worst hit I mean? in this situation are potentially going to need to wait until September to get their check. Wow. So, because yeah, I mean, he wanted his name, name oh, no, no, but it, it'll be Donald J. Trump that gave you this money. That mm-hmm. That is, I mean, that's moving into sort of um, totalitarian, authoritarian dictatorship. Oh, so right. this, this is where Trump really, I mean, people laughed when he did his Trump infinity sign and the sort of Trump forever. Like, Trump, yeah. another four years, another 16, I'll just keep going. Um, people were sort of like, ah, ha, ha, Donald Trump, nah, man. I think this guy's got that, and he said this guy's going to want oh, total power. Like, if he wins this next election in November, um, which again, some dangerous precedents have been set with local elections, and we've spoke about mm-hmm. that in previous weeks. And um, for what and low numbers are really going to fucking suit Donald yeah. Trump more than anybody Which else. In Wisconsin, yeah, yeah. I think we lost that to a technical issue as well. Um, um, but I Wisconsin ran a, a local by election during the lockdown, and we were saying that you know, voter turnout is massive for Republicans who are already gerrymandering, and he's you know, 
potentially going to, you know, look to use this as precedent to force people to have the, the November election at a time when people don't want to be outstanding in queues to vote. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, which is no no beyond the pale. Um, mm, no, I, think, I don't think know, they'll. I don't think they'll delay it. I genuinely don't. I think if if Trump if it looks like Trump's going to win, um, he'll be absolutely strong arming through the election in November. I don't think that they, oh, they'll do anything to, to stop it from happening. Definitely. Which is, I think as well. You know, when you talk about some of the stuff that they're trying to get away with, um, and you know, pushing the lock when it comes to elections. Um, a few of his pals have been pushing their work this week as well. Um, Michael Cohen, his old lawyer, mm -hmm. who, you know, was convicted and, you know, cut a deal and blah, blah, blah. Uh, he was released early for prison over fears of contacting, uh, contracting coronavirus. And not for actually having coronavirus, just being scared that whilst he was in prison, he would catch it. Um, I don't know how long he had left on his sentence, but you've got to imagine that it couldn't have been long for him to make that agreement. Um, I've not got the exact figure at hand, but off the back of that, um, Paul Manafort, you know, the guy with the melted rubber face, yeah. who was his campaign manager when Russia was fucking with the election, yeah. uh, allegedly, or in my opinion, if you want. Um, Manafort is also asking for his sentence to be commuted over fears of coronavirus. This cunt has got fucking seven years left on his sentence. This guy has got seven mm. years to go and he's like, I'm afraid of catching coronavirus and going to let me out. And you're just like, wow. He's been in prison, what, eight months, nine months, something. It's just the balls out nature of these guys to actually push the look at a time like this is, it should never be underestimated. And I think we've seen that time and again, particularly in America. Aye, absolutely agree, mate. Um, on the upside though, on American terms, and this is this is a genuine it's going to sound sarcastic, but it's, it's one of the ones I stumbled across the story and was like, whoa, um, March or uh, March this year is the first time that there have been no school shootings in America since 2002. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's For absolutely sake. fucking insane that it took pretty much the literal end of the world to get that one out of the line. Um, but I, this is the first year or the first month in some like 18 years that there's no been a school shooting and it's because America's almost completely locked in like us and it really mm. shouldn't take that no, it really shouldn't take that that's it man hopefully you know that'll I mean? maybe wake some of them up to the fact that <laughs> do you know what I mean like that that's an incredible Aye. thing I mean well let's just say that that's a <laughs> are we ending on a positive with that um, but th uh -huh. I think that there's th there's a lot of stuff like that changes and things that you're starting mm. to see as a byproduct, like oil productions dropped. Been or there's been they've been told that they need to sort of stop drilling by like ten percent because there's no demand. Mm -hmm. I think basically because the airplanes aren't in the sky. Yeah. Um. The the air's never really been clear or pollution will be going down, but things like that, like you're saying, man, like that's that's like that sort of like it's a bit of a sort of double blow into it. Is that that's it should be a wake up call to Americans. Yeah to say well hold on a minute hopefully. why is it taking this to stop our kids from dying uh -huh. you know what I mean but I'm hope hopefully again like we've said in previous episodes um, I'm hoping that this crisis situation means that we get to reflect on a lot of things that mm -hmm. have stopped from happening or like positive circumstances that have maybe just because we're in lockdown um, mm -hmm. but that's an incredible statistic man like incredible uh, to think that absolutely. not one school shooting has happened um, and it's been the first time. Thirty days, aye, man, that's fucking incredible, man. Aye. Absolutely. I think if we're looking for a, a kind of, and finally out, I'm no, I'm no touching Scottish football with a barge pole this week. There's too much shit going on that <laughs> I don't even fully. I think, I think we'd probably need an entire other podcast day saying it's turned into an absolute pantomime. Um, and I think you know some of the the stuff on statements that we talked about in the past, haven't we? People need to calm their jets as we just went into absolute overdrive. So it may be something we dial, you know, come back around in later weeks as it becomes more clear what's actually going on. But right now, I really don't want to get into it. But Aye. I would say if we're going to go for a wee and finally, um, especially since we've already touched on conspiracies a number of times in recent weeks as we've chatted, like Eamon Holmes thinks that we shouldn't listen to the government on. 5G and coronavirus. Aye, fuck's sake. Did you see this guy? Aye, I did. With your, uh, you Ofcom have stepped the in. mainstream media. Aye, I think Ofcom have stepped in to, to investigate it and stuff. I mean, Eamon Holmes has clearly been spending too much time either in <clears throat> his WhatsApp group chat or some kind of fucking face conspiracy Facebook thing. But <laughs> this, is, 
this is a this is a problem. Like I, I'm, this is a big problem that we have. A, even guys like him, who I mean, in the grand scheme of things, like who gives a fuck what Eamon Holmes thinks? But yeah, um, he is on the a lot of grannies to be fair. Well, I that and he, he's on mainstream TV, and yep. he, he's got a platform that hits a lot of fucking people's eyes and ears, and he's get especially when everybody's sitting in the house. Exactly, and he's got a responsibility for that, and I think that he should be getting fucking held accountable for that. Um, Absolutely. To think that, again, ah. we, we spoke about how, I mean, just the simple fact that coronavirus exists in nearly every country on the planet and 5G is only available in like 40 of them just instantly tells you that it's a load <laughs> of fucking shite. Um, nah, yeah, like pure. But, Don't use logic, but dude, come on. I know, absolutely, but this is a problem that we're facing, Um more so now than ever that we're all connected and we're all plugged in that these narratives and this sort of scepticism which I think is healthy if you're going to be sceptical, absolutely but don't allow yourself to go down a fucking rabbit hole of no. they've, they've locked us down so that they can lay fibre optic cables that are going to gear us or going to kill everybody 5G is going to kill everybody I've seen some pretty rational people talk about this yeah. in terms of that they think it might be a real thing. I don't get it, man. I mean, I've been doing a lot of rabbit really holes and, and I've spoke a lot, um, and especially even just like, no, even on podcasts, but just with like you about crazy conspiracy yeah. theories. But I, I enjoy them. I, I don't, I would never Aye. ever go out and attack somebody or set fire to a fucking inanimate no. object. Well, after I respect to sport. Aye, that's so you, it. you look at them and go, oh fuck, that's a mad story, that. You know what I mean? They exactly. don't actually then go and dedicate your life to proving that it's right. Aye, absolutely. But I think the problem that we that we live way or that in this time, we live in an information age, and that includes good information and bad information. Um oh, aye. I don't know how we get a grip of it. Um I don't you think should know the difference, but you should definitely know the difference of well, Damon Holmes because I'm not gonna go as far as to say that, you know, I would consider him a journalist. He's definitely a presenter, and I know that he spent time as you know a news reader, you know reading auto cues for like Sky News and stuff like that. Um, so I mean, he should really know the difference between good information and bad information, and the importance of no spreading it. What what really stuck in my craw with him was that it was like you shouldn't trust the mainstream media. That was pretty much verbatim what he said. Well, like, sitting there, mate, and the mainstream I mean, media, like you're on fucking GMTV or whatever, like, <laughs> you're on, like, a pure primetime programming slot on a terrestrial television channel, like, it does not get more mainstream than what you are actively doing right now. I mean, this guy is, like, fucking so mainstream that I genuinely wouldn't be surprised if he was both and and ex fucking da. You know what I mean? Like, he's just <laughs> passed the mainstream genes down through the generations, you know what I mean? Like, he's, he's just completely lacking any sort of self-awareness kind of similar to you know, J.K. Rowan and a few others that we've already touched on. You know Aye, what I mean? man. But what he was, what he was playing at, I absolutely have no idea. Man. Aye, neither did I, mate. And I think, like, like you said, man, and 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 finally, is <laughs> Pierce Morgan is still a cunt. Let's just end Aye. it at that. Like this guy's self-serving himself, and he's he's white knight thing. But this guy's yep. still a cunt. Like, I and now the son are at it as well, getting it. You know, three papers for our NHS heroes, oh, and you're like. I, this is people are going to use this as a smoke screen. It's all it is. Absolutely, I mean, right twice a day. You know I mean? The 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 EE free data, Q uh, jumps at Tesco. These are all well and good, but let's just mm -hmm. put our weight behind getting these people a proper fucking wage, and let's stop like using businesses in a way of self promotion or using Being this virus. conditions that they deserve. Like, Aye, no having exactly. to pay on twenty quid a year to do your job. No having to pay to park at your work. Like. All these things that actually impact their quality of life and need to change, not just standing at your door clapping or shouting. I mean, it's the, the Piers Morgan interviews have got a bit fucking WWE again for me, where right. the Tory guys are lining up to get spanked by the headmaster just to, you know what I mean, to keep people engaged and, you know, whatever else they, they don't want them looking at. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's so pantomime. So it is like, on everybody's front. Like, but I am with you in that. He's, he's still a cunt. Aye, mate, definitely. Well, mate, another week. It's been good talking to you. Decompressed good a bit. Day, mate. Um, Aye, definitely. We'll get back again next week. We'll maybe even touch on the Scottish football piece, which, again, if we're talking about <laughs> fucking Panamines, has been like 
amazing to watch the, the last oh. week but we'll maybe touch on that next week mate but till then mate cheers for that again um, we'll talk later, mate. cheers man bye